Hey guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at a GTX 1070 Ti PCB. Uh, this is Colorful's Vulcan X edition, and well, uh, has quite the PCB. Um, and you know, it is also a lot taller than normal. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our coffee lake temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds reused on top of the IHS, like Cryonaut and Hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. So let's get right into it, as there's not really much else to say about the card. You have a minor supporting voltage, well, you have the PEX VRM down here, which is normal for uh, basically all NVIDIA cards, this VRM exists, and this runs on one, this outputs one volt, and it powers the PCIe interface, as well as some internal PLLs of the GPU core. Very important to keep the card working, completely useless for overclocking until you're well below zero. So, only really worth worrying about if you're on liquid nitrogen. And even then, it's really not a high power output VRM, so it's, you know, you're never going to see anybody do bother with doing a two-phase design of that. It's always just a fully integrated buck converter like we have here. Um, up here, we have what I suspect is the 1.8 volts uh, rail, which NVIDIA cards require for some internal PLLs on the GPU core, as well as their BIOS system. Um, on... Cards with GDDR5X, this would also be used for power uh, for the VPP line of the GDDR5X chips, but on a GT the GTX 1070 Ti uses GDDR5, so basically this is here just for the BIOS system and the GPU core. Now then we're going to move into the actually interesting VRMs, even if they do just as much as the other two in terms of overclocking on air cooling and water cooling. This right here is the vCore VRM, so that provides the bulk of the power that your GPU uses. And behind that we find the memory VRM right here. So that powers the GDDR5 memory chips located around the GPU core. So the vCore VRM is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve phase VRM design. And so naturally it is using a doubling scheme. Um, the doublers are located on the back of the card and they are not just doublers, it's actually dual drivers with the phase extension functionality. So basically you have one chip uh, controlling uh, basically turning the MOSFETs in this VRM on and off. Well, you have four MOSFETs hooked up to one dr driver IC, which drives the four MOSFETs, well, drives two MOSFETs at a time. So it, it fa effectively, it looks like a 12-phase. This is the only real way to do a 12-phase VRM design. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how exactly it works, but yes, this, this is the right way to do a 12-phase. There's a way to make something that looks like this and isn't actually running out of like isn't running in 12 phase mode um, but this is the proper way to do it the chips for that are located on the back those are fed the pwm signal from this chip which that is the completely typical for nvidia cards up 9511 uh voltage controller this is an eight phase chip um so here it's being only used in six phase mode so they're not using two of the phases available on the up 9511 and uh that's because you can't, like, if you're using a doubling scheme, you have to double all of your phases. You can't double, like, four and then use four more natively from the chip. That doesn't work. So that's why, you know, th this is being in, uh, used in six-phase mode here. And the UP9511 supports switching frequencies up to 600 kilohertz, which, considering that, and I ran out of space there, uh, up to 600 kilohertz, and basically that's how quickly it turns the MOSFETs on and off in the VRM. Now, since this is using a doubling scheme, this 600 kilohertz would actually go to the driver chips on the back of the card at 600 kilohertz, and once it comes out of the driver chip to the phase, like the, the, these MOSFETs up here would be switching at 300 kilohertz, and the MOSFETs down here would be switching also at 300 kilohertz because basically the way the doubling schemes all work is that they take the 600, they take the input PWM signal and just split it in half. So every other pulse goes, every other pulse goes to the other uh, VR, uh, other phase. So 
That's basically how this works. Now then let's talk about the actual MOSFETs used. These are uh, dual NFETs from Alpha and Omega Semiconductor. These are AOE uh, 6930s. These would have, you would have, Colorful really likes using them. Um, I've seen these on a GTX 1080 Ti from Colorful, but the first time you would have probably seen these is on the GTX Titan XP, um, as NVIDIA uses it. That the, these for their reference card. These are actually really nice MOSFETs, very low RDS on, on the low side fat, um, at zero point, well, no, wait, 1.05 milliohms RDS on for the low side fat at five volt gate to source. And I'm using five volt gate to source because I have no idea what drive voltage, um, colorful is actually using on this card. I assume it's five volts because they do have this VRM here, which, um, the UP9511 and a bunch of logic on this card actually requires a five volt rail. So it just makes sense to reuse it for driving as well. Um, and then the high side MOSFET built into the AOE 6930 is seven milliohm RDS on at that same five volt gate to source voltage. Um, luckily like this is pretty high, but the high side MOSFET is all about being able to turn on and off quickly and not all about its RDS on. And in that department, this thing can turn on at speeds of as high as four, uh, nanoseconds, uh, turn on and three nanoseconds turn off. So this is like, this is really fast. Um, you find a lot of high end MOSFETs out there that are sort of in the 10 nanosecond range. Uh, for both of these. And then when you start looking at the really cheap MOSFETs that are also available, you start looking at 20 to 30 nanoseconds switching speeds. So, uh, well, turn falling times and rising times. And well, those are basically atrocious. Um, but these are really, really fast, definitely in line with some of the top uh, MOSFETs that you can find out there. So the end result is that with this, you know, with this high end MOSFET, and the ridiculous phase count, this VRM is absolutely insane overkill for a GTX 1070 Ti. Um, so under normal operating conditions, you'd be looking at this VRM pushing to the core about 1.09 uh, volts, which that's the maximum voltage you can set through something like Afterburner. And you're gonna be looking at currents between 150 and 200 amps. For th these kinds of current levels at 300 kilohertz switching for frequency because, you know, um, doubling scheme and 5 volt gate to source voltage. Uh, for 150A, you're looking at about 8 watts of heat output. For that 200 amps, it's looking at around 13 watts of heat output. So this is really, really efficient. Um, massive overkill on power colors. Uh, I mean, colorfuls. Messing up the names here. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's colorful, not power color less colorful names would be good. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, very, very efficient VRM, ridiculous power capability. Um, very overkill. I really think, you know, for, some people would probably prefer it if this wasn't as tall and the VRM was a few phases less. But um, as far as VRM designs go, there's nothing to complain about here. If for some reason you decided that you really want to run this GTX 1070 Ti on liquid nitrogen, which to be completely fair, since no GTX 1070 Ti is actually specifically designed for liquid nitrogen, you might as well run, run whatever you come across. So uh, if you decided to run this one, uh, you'd be pushing probably voltages around 1.35 volts. Um, some cards will be slightly lower, some cards will be slightly higher, and about 250 amps current draw. So basically the reason why you don't go higher on the core voltage for liquid nitrogen is because JP104 really doesn't work well at high voltage. It basically doesn't scale. And I've seen, like, I've already overclocked a 1070 on liquid nitrogen, and everybody who's worked with 1080s and 1070s uh, before can confirm this basically the jp104 chip really doesn't like high voltages even at very low negative temperatures so you end up getting stuck around that sort of voltage range and current draw um which means that the vrm even under liquid nitrogen which would be a kind of extreme usage scenario ends up only producing about 19 watts of heat um so again you know the it's ridiculous overkill. Like th this VRM wouldn't look out of place on a GTX 1080 Ti, but here it is on a 1070 Ti. So uh, props to Colorful for splurging on components here. 
Now then, the memory VRM is a two-phase design. This is better than what you would find on most cards in sort of, well, just in general. A lot of cards come with single-phase memory power, and two phases can help with memory overclocking a tiny amount. Um, not anything huge, but it can help, so that's nice to see. And the MOSFETs used are, again, the same Alpha and Omega 6930s. Um, for GDDR5, you're going to be looking at an output voltage of around 1.5 volts, maybe 1.55 volts on some cards. Um, so it depends, but I'm doing the rating at 1.5 volts. The controller is a UP90, no, not 90, 1658. Um, it integrates both, uh, well, the driver circuits for both uh, phases. So there's no actual, like, basically there's no other driver chips anywhere around this VRM. Um, and this chip supports two phases up to 300 kilohertz switching frequency. And I ran out of space again. I, you, you'd think I'd learn after the first time, wouldn't you? <laughs> but evidently not. So 300 kilohertz, 1.5 volts, again, using that 5 volt gate to source voltage because they're going to use the same drive voltage everywhere. Um, you'd be looking at maybe 25 amps of current output on two phase memory on the GDDR5 because we do only have uh, eight memory chips here. And at that current output level, you're only looking at about 1.5 watts of heat output. So again, great job colorful uh, with the VRM here. And you know, it's a, it's a good thing that these VRMs are both so ridiculously uh, efficient because well, the heatsink is kind of just a bit like the VRM heatsink for this card is just basically a sheet of aluminum. And that like, I mean, I guess it has more surface area than the MOSFETs, but that's not really, you know, that does that's not exactly confidence inspiring in the VRM cooling department. But with the heat output levels that these VRMs are putting out, like the heat output on these VRMs is so low that I think think Colorful can get away with the uh, anemic looking uh, base plate VRM cooler. So that covers the VRM portion of the card. One cool feature that uh, Colorful decided to add onto the card is you actually get voltage read points up here. So you can check your NVDD, so that's your core voltage, FBVDD, which I am not sure what that, that's going to be the memory. Um, so that's going to be the memory one there. Uh, I'm not used to, you know, and I don't overclock NVIDIA cards that much, so I'm not used to the terminology used here. So that's going to be vCore. Uh, PEX VDD, that's the VRM I pointed out down here. 1.8 volts is the one I pointed out over here. And you also get a ground tab, so that's really nice. They don't have a measurement point for the this VRM down here, which I assume is 5 volts. Um, which is kind of interesting, but this is not the first card to like include all the other voltages and not bother with the dry voltage. And this can be handy if you know your experience, like if for some reason you aren't able to RMA the card and are having issues with it running, uh, these voltage read points are really convenient because you basically don't have to like figure out how to stab the right capacitor for this one if you, if you think that there's an issue with this rail or that rail or any other rail on the card. So uh, you know, it's a nice feature to have for overclockers, though I think for most daily users this is completely pointless. Um, still a nice addition, and it doesn't really cost anything to do, um, as it is just a PCB, you know, small PCB design tweak. Now then, if you want to really let the card fly, basically take NVIDIA's power limitations off of it, the shunt resistors for doing that are all located down here, and I wrote over one of them. Um, so you have three shunt resistors because you have three power inputs, you have two 8 pins, and you have the PCIe as well. And so each of these shunt resistors monitors the current going from one of those sources. I am not sure which one is for which source. Um, if you're planning to short these out, the best way to do that is generally to apply a thin layer of liquid metal across them. Um, because if you try to short them out by like soldering over them or something, you run the risk of shorting them out too much. And if the GPU detects that the power, uh, the power reading provided by the shunt resistors is too low, it will put the card in safety mode. And basically, the card is, uh, safety mode on a GTX series, GTX 10 series card is basically the card is stuck at 139, uh, 139 megahertz core clock, which is you know, which basically makes the card completely useless. So. You know, thin layer of liquid metal is your best bet for getting a easy power mod. If you want to do something more advanced, the INA3221 is up here. I've done a advanced uh, 
power mod guide for like completely remove all power limitations on these cards uh guide on my own channel so at actually hardcore overclocking um but for most users it, it, you know if you're it, all the if you're at the point that you're modifying but you don't have a soldering iron really just thin layer of liquid metal and you don't want to go heavy on the liquid metal because liquid metal does eat solder so if you apply too much of it you're you are running the risk of the shunts basically the, well the solder dissolving and the shunts falling off so you know be careful when modifying the cards because uh you you can basically end up killing the card and uh well, RMA is not going to be okay with it when you send them a card missing components. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment down below or any questions you have. If you would like to support what we do here at, uh, with Gamers Nexus, there's a Patreon link down in the description below. And if you would like to watch, you know, see more uh, extreme overclocking kind of content like the well, more VRM stuff and other overclocking uh, ridiculousness. I have my own channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking. You can go check that out. Um, I imagine there will be a link down in the comments below for that. So once again, thank you for watching and see you next time.